Hello, everybody, and happy Canada's Agriculture Day. Welcome to our third virtual field trip of the day. My name is Madeline, and I work for Farm and Food Care, and I'm happy to be one of the uh, co-hosts for today's event. And my name is Melissa, and I work for Agriculture in the Classroom Canada. Maybe you joined us for our two previous tours in Ontario and Nova Scotia at an egg farm and a chicken farm. Well, um, we still have two more, two more tours and presentations to go. Um, we're going to be first at an Alberta um, canola research station, and then we'll be moving on to a beef ranch in Alberta later today. And Canada's Agriculture Day is a really special day, but this year it's a little bit more special because we're launching our Real Dirt on Real Dirt on Farming in the Classroom resource. Um, this resource links to grades seven to twelve curriculum, and it gives students an opportunity to explore the key areas of animal welfare, crops and plants, sustainability, agri agriculture policy, and more. And this project was a partnership between Farm and Food Care and Agriculture in the Classroom Canada and was proudly supported by Farm Credit Canada. Perfect. So just in the chat, I would love for you to let us know where you're tuning in from. I see we've got 47, um, 47 folks on the line. So if you want to just put it into the comments where you're joining from, um, your class, your grade, your school, um, and we'd love to hear from you. Also, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. All these tours are being recorded, so depending on your time zone or what your schedule is looking like today, you can come back to them at any time and watch. Um, you can access the resource at the at realdirtonfarming.ca. And if you want to get print copies of the Real Dirt on Farming publication, um, you can contact your provincial member organization through Agriculture in the Classroom. So um, there will be a live Q&A that takes place at the end of the tour. I can already see Miss Bradko's class from Carberry Collegiate, um, Porcupine Plain in Saskatchewan grade five and Nip in Saskatchewan. So welcome everyone. Awesome. So it's time to get started and introduce you to our host for this tour. So I'm just going to add her here. This is Brittany. Brittany is a canola researcher in Alberta at the University of Alberta. Hi, Brittany. Hey. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're going to be talking to us about today? Definitely. So I'm a master's student at the University of Alberta, and uh, I was asked to talk about my research, but I first like to talk about canola how and how we grow it across the prairies and give you a little bit of history about our food. Awesome. That sounds great. So anybody who's tuning in right now or, or jumps on the line, feel free to drop your questions in the comments and we will get to them throughout Brittany's presentation. Um, Brittany put together a pretty thorough presentation on all things canola. Uh, we would love to do a live tour at a canola farm right now, but Brittany can probably talk to you about why that wouldn't be quite as interesting um, given the time of year. So I'll let her <laughs> touch on that. Uh, again, just drop your comments into, um, ask, sorry, drop your questions into the comments. Okay, so let's take it away, Brittany. Awesome, well, thank you. So yeah, as uh, Madeline touched on, it is, this is the scene here uh, right now. I live in Legal, Alberta, which is about 30 minutes north of Edmonton. And the challenge of Canada's Agriculture Day being in February is that uh, we don't have any canola growing. So rather than, um, you know, taking you around a snowy field and a farm with equipment put away or being worked on, I thought I would take videos on the farm in the lab and then in the greenhouse and, and put them all here for us. So unfortunately we don't get the live tour, but hopefully we get the best of the three worlds that um, I am a part of. So before we get into canola, I just wanna give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I was never born on a farm, so I'm not from the farm. Both sides of my family uh, are farmers. Uh, they were either in a beef or a crop uh, background, but my parents did not uh, continue on the farm. So my sister and I rode horses, and this is really as close to agriculture as we got. So I grew up on an acreage about 15 minutes east of Edmonton, so really, really close, and I was growing up quite urban, even though I was on an acreage. I uh, went to school in Edmonton and Sherwood Park, and I was actually going to 
you know, go to school to be a hairdresser. And I'm not totally sure how my avenue switched past to getting into pre-vet, but I thought, you know, my passion was in animals that I would then explore helping them as a profession. Um, and it, you know, about three years into that program, I realized that I really didn't love learning about the circulatory system or the digestive system of a goat. Rather, I really enjoyed learning about plants. And so I switched into plant sciences or to crop sciences. And this is when I really started to learn more um, about cropping agriculture, as you would have guessed. So, and I, I want to tell this story. I tell it a few times, but I think it really resonates with a lot of people. I was in the grocery store and I picked up a bag of spinach and I, I vouched for the one that was labeled organic because that's the one I thought was healthier. And I looked at the price. It was, it was more expensive, not something that I could really afford at that, at that time being a student, but I thought it was healthier for me. So it was definitely worth the extra money. And so, of course, you know, through my course of um, learning in school, I learned more about, you know, the misinformation or the misleading food labels that we have in our grocery stores, uh, but also from my colleagues who were farmers and who actually grew the food. I learned a ton through them. And so that really carried on my passion, you know, in my professional life, but also in my personal life, educating people um, of our food system and how, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of it and how high quality we have quality standards of food in Canada. So before going back to complete my master's, I did work as an agronomist for six years. And that's when I started to learn more about things happening in the field and how everything's changed and how everything is backed by science. And so the reason why I went back to school, and I will tell you guys, I've never done well in school. <laughs> so, you know, it was really hard. I had a very hard time in grade school. I had a hard time getting into university for my undergrad. I had a hard time staying in it. And I did have a hard time getting into my master's. Uh, but I realized the benefits of, you know, the, the, the takeaways from school. You know, I wanted to learn about how research was done properly, what's good research, and really dig into why we come to these scientific conclusions. So that's why I went back to school. So there's a ton of science in agriculture, and I think sometimes it gets overlooked because we don't know a ton about agriculture, but there's a lot of science and a lot of technology um, you know, and as you can see in, in current days, like COVID-19 and climate change, there's a ton of science and technology involved in that as well. So when we look at food, and I want to talk about this just because we are going to be talking about canola, which uh, is a transgenic, for the most part, grown across Canada. Um, you know, when we, when we hear things about, you know, um, if you can pronounce the ingredients, you don't want to put it in your body. Well, if you take a look on the right with all the strawberries, that's an all natural strawberry. So everything is made up of chemicals, whether this is an organic or you know, conventionally produced strawberry, um, it's made up of chemicals. And a lot of these chemicals I can't pronounce. And so don't be afraid of these chemicals because that is just the composition of a strawberry, mm -hmm. regardless of how it's produced. And so we look at these icons to the left, papayas. Uh, I'm sure we've all tried it maybe once or twice. So all the papayas here, uh, in the world are transgenic because there's a disease attacking them. And without the use of transgenic, we would not have papayas anymore. And so actually our common household bananas, Cavendish bananas, and the citrus or the oranges in Florida are under the same threat. So without um, this disease attacking them, and if we, you know, we do actually have a transgenic banana, but it hasn't been commercially or it hasn't been released to the public yet because of um, the worries and the fears around it. So I guess the consequences from this is either we aren't going to have bananas anymore, or we're going to see less of them for more expensive, or if we use a transgenic banana, we can continue to have an affordable source of nutrients uh, for all households. So we have to kind of think of the, the bigger long-term picture um, of our food. We look at uh, watermelons. Watermelons are typically, they typically have seeds in them, but through the use of a different breeding method, we now have seedless watermelon. And now we won't remember this, but our parents or our grandparents we remember that, that grapefruits used to be white and now they're red. And that's again, through a different breeding technique or method in order to get red grapefruits. So 
in one way or another, all of our food has been modified some way, and it's not necessarily through moving genes like at the DNA level, but it could be through other forms. So when we look at um, specifically canola, I want you guys just to keep this in mind, that this is something that we have to have a lot of confidence in. There's a ton of research going on, and it is very safe. But first, I want everyone to join um, with me in doing this quiz if you're able to. Now, if you can open another browser or if you have two devices, you can play along with me. So we can go to kahoot.it. If not, we can either, uh, you can comment your answers, um, put your answers in the comment section or just answer um, at home by, to yourself. <laughs> I just wanted no. to interrupt really quickly, um, Brittany. We do have a question from Carberry Collegiate Grade 6. How can strawberries have ingredients in them? So I think you kind of touched on it a little bit, but talking more about that um, that chemical composition. Yeah, so it's it, when you think of ingredients, you're always thinking of like maybe baking bread and all the ingredients that goes into it. But at the more like molecular chemical level, there's it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's made with chemicals. To right. have things like reproduced in real life, um, the the strawberries, you say I have to think of it as like the cell level. It's a very yeah. lower level. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we've got the pin up there. And again, if you can't join on another browser or another device, that's totally fine. Um, we can go through these trivia questions with Brittany, and we'll learn some more. So, are people able to? Uh, See the number, the game pin? Yep. Okay, I haven't, I don't have anyone joined yet. Okay. And right now, Brittany, we're seeing your kahoot.it with me slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me just change that then. Just noticing in the chat, um, Rona is saying they can't click the Kahoot link. You're actually just going to go to kahoot.it in your URL, and then you'll be able to plug that code in, 8421826. Okay. Perfect. David gonna... on Facebook says he's good to go. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to switch my screens here, of course. One second. Alrighty. There we go. Awesome. Yeah, we've got some friends playing. Awesome. Okay, so about these are great names. Perfect. <laughs> Well, probably, we can probably just get started, Brittany, with who we've got in the chat, and the rest can go into the comments. Okay. I actually, I can't get going. We have to stop the, uh, it always keeps doing a 15 second, shoot, keeps doing a 15 second um, countdown every time someone answers. <laughs> so. No one enter anymore, please. <laughs> if that's going to be possible. It might not be possible. We'll see here. I know kids love Kahoot, so. <laughs> All right. Let's pause. Oh, okay. We're at nine. Eight. So, ah! <laughs> Bring it up, Eagle. This backfired. <laughs> Shoot. Okay. Mm. Yeah, we okay. might just need to. Yeah, Brittany, could we ask the questions and then people could answer in the chat or could we maybe do this like um, at the end of the video? Uh, yeah, you know what? I'll just go through it um, myself. Yeah, that'd be perfect. And we can just um, plug plug the answers into the. Yeah, into the okay. Chat. All right, so give me a second here. And I'll start this out. Sorry, guys. That's all good. I am not a huge Kahooter. 
So, oh, well, let me tell you, the students love Kahoot. It's a hit. <laughs> Okay. And okay, you know what? We're gonna have to just go through it. Um, so one question I had was, um, what is canola? Is mm. it a plant? Is it a plant? Is it a floral? Is it a breed of cow? Or is it an insect. Okay, so everyone put your, your answers to that question in the comments. Brittany, can you repeat the answers? What is canola? Is it a plant? Is it a floral? Is it an insect? Or is it a breed of cattle? Get some answers in here. We have an answer saying a floral. Okay, so that's pretty close. Um, there are a lot of flowers on the canola plant, but it is actually a plant. Okay. Okay, I'm just trying to pull it up myself here. Okay. The next question is, um, I'm trying to remember now. Of course, I didn't print out the questions myself. I'm trying to sign in to Kahoot so I can go through the questions. This is really poor planning on my part. I apologize, guys. It's okay. all good, Brittany. If we want to just skip ahead to the next part of the presentation, then if we can loop back to the Kahoot at the end, if there's time, I think that's still still a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the um, the question was, oh, shoot. Okay. Okay, the next question is, sorry, I'm going to go through these really quickly now. No, this Kahoot has just taken too long. So I was going to, um, the questions are going to lead into the next part of my questions, uh, slides, but unfortunately, that's not going to happen. So we'll <laughs> get to that later. So these are the iconic canola fields. Um, and maybe if you're from Western Canada, you're very familiar with these, but in Eastern Canada, they might not be as prominent, but they, uh, canola is one of like the most, um, top two most common crop grown in Western Canada. Brittany, I'm just going to share your presentation with us again so we can see. Oh, shoot. No problem. It is a pandemic and we're all learning as we go. Oh. I'm sure this is going to be the first okay. time some of these students have encountered some technical difficulties. I think we've all been there. Yeah, definitely. All right. There we go. Right. We're back. <laughs> So these are the iconic canola fields that I was mentioning. Like I said, we see these very um, quite a bit across the western western prairies. And I can't talk about canola without talking about the fathers of canola. So Dr. Downey and Dr. Stephenson actually created canola. So this is a crop that was created in Canada, which was one of the questions in Kahoot. And it is grown worldwide. It is grown around the world. So in order for um, Canola is trademarked actually Canada, the Canola Council of Canada. And so if other countries want to use this for their crop, um, then they um, they can, they just need to either pay us for it or they can use a different um, term. And so we see like double zero or oil seed rate being used. So there's a lot of information on this slide, but what I wanted to point out that in the forties is when we had rapeseed. And so your grandparents might talk about rapeseed and it wasn't just a name change to canola. Um, in the 60s is when, specifically 1967 is canola, when canola was created and it has very two specific um, distinguishing features of it. And that's how it differentiates from rape seeds. So not just a name change. And then in 95, as I spoke about um, at the beginning of my presentation, that's where we have GMO or transgenic canola released in uh, the 90s for farmers released as in, farmers are now able to grow that uh, if they so choose to. And so this is canola up close. Like I said, there's differences between rapeseed canola, which was conventionally produced, and then transgenic canola, which was then um, uh, used a breeding method to alter it at the DNA level. So 80% of canola grown across Canada is transgenic canola. And what this does for our environment is this, you know, it reduces the amount of pesticides being used, used, it reduces our times we have to pass in the field. 
uh, so lower fuel consumption, and it also lowers our soil erosion. Um, so when you till the soil, it loosens the soil. And so we have high water and high wind, it's going to um, cause that soil to um, be lost. And so I don't know if anyone places their cups upside down in their cabinets, but this is because of uh, the dirty 30s and the dust bowl coming in. And so that's just kind of a habit carried down from generations. But this is why typically people place their cups upside down in their cupboards. And so now we're going to move to the farm that I guys that I promised you guys. And so this is called an air cart or an air drill. And so the beginning of it, uh, there are three compartments to have the seed and fertilizer. The middle part here is called the drill. So this will fold down and span about 50 feet in width. And these hoses connect the two and it uses air to shoot the fertilizer and seed through the hoses and down through the shanks. The shanks are then put into the ground and it has a very precise placement of the seed and the fertilizer. And then it's packed by that wheel that follows it. And so every farmer has their own setup. This particular farmer has a second cart on their setup or on their unit. And this is just so that they can go longer time in the field without having to stop and fill up. So this is a really big piece of equipment. Uh, we f farmers in Western Canada farm hundreds or thousands of acres. And so they need really big pieces of equipment to get that seed in the ground as basically as quick as possible because a lot of our crops are seeded in the spring, uh, specifically canola, we grow spring canola. And so we have a very short window to seed them so that they can eventually mature uh, for the fall for us to harvest. So we need these big pieces of equipment in order to get the seed down. And we look at these tires. Um, we have big tires and a lot of tires. So that evens out the pressure in our field so we don't get compaction in our soils. And the reason why we don't want compaction is because we have like holes to hold water and for our roots to penetrate and oxygen to move. So we, we don't want compaction in our fields. And so that's what these big tires are used for. So now when we go into the field on the left hand side, this is baby canola. Uh, one of my favorite stages of canola. Also one of the most vulnerable stages of canola. But as you can see, these are very straight lines and that's in part due to the shanks that are going into the ground and putting that seed placement very uh, particular, but also because of GPS. So like I said, we have a lot of technology in agriculture. We have a uh, GPS that we can go in straight lines that we can figure out which path in the field is the most efficient so we don't have overlap or we don't have to do unnecessary passes to get to a smaller area or anything like that. It's all very precise. And what that does is then it lowers um, costs for farmers, but also lowers the environmental impact, right? So we have less fuel consumption, but we also have less overlap of say fertilizer. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have like sectional control in our tractors. So say if you have like a, a 20 foot pass and your unit is 50 feet wide, it'll only see those 20 feet. So it's very particular to make sure that we don't put more inputs into our soil than we have to. And so when we look to the right hand side of the field, these are baby canola. And so we're really trying to protect the cotyledons of that canola plant. Um, and like I said, they're very vulnerable. So there's that little flea beetle there. He really likes to eat on the cotyledon, on the stem, on the leaf. And also we look at these cutworms. They like to travel below ground and cut the stem off of canola. And so it kind of looks like a, a, a tree has just fallen down in the field. So as small as these guys are, they can wreak havoc on our, on our crops. Um, but we do follow very precise like economic thresholds, which means that we don't, Right, unless we absolutely have to, unless it will impact the end results or the yield or crop at the end of the year. Um, because not only are insecticides expensive, but they also kill our beneficial insects. And so we really don't like spraying insecticides if we don't have to. Brittany, can I ask one quick question? Yes. So you mentioned cotyledons. Can you just quickly describe what those are for the folks who might not know? Yes, yeah, so cotyledons are these kidney shaped beans right here. And so with canola, it has its growing point above ground. And so these cotyledons are the first, we can say leaves that come out of the ground and it collects all the energy from the sun. And it's what pushes out those, those first few true leaves of canola. So we need to make sure we maintain as much green matter as possible so that it can capture as much energy um, as it can. Awesome. All right, so canola goes through many different grow growing stages in order to get to the flowering canola. 
Uh, so it cabbages or it spreads out, it gets really tall, and then it produces flowers. Um, and these flowers only last for a couple weeks. And these flowers will eventually fall off and then produce pods. And these pods, which are coming up, uh, this is a very immature pod, but they grow and the seeds inside them, um, that's where the seeds are produced. So as everything matures, everything gets bigger. So these canola plants are obviously very tall. They're on a bench, but a lot of research also goes into making sure that they're an appropriate height so that they're more manageable when we have to go harvest them. And this plant here is just a little bit more mature. So as you can see, those pods are bigger and it's on the entire plant. So on the, the main stem, the side branches. And so we don't only want a lot of pods, but we want a lot of seeds. And we want those seeds to be um, high quality and quantity of oil. So as we grow canola here, there's of course many abiotic and biotic stresses, which means there's a lot of insects, there's, there's diseases, there's weeds, there's um, weather that impact growing canola. So in the middle there, you can see that there's, there's no pods, there's no flowers. Uh, that's because there was a lot of heat at one point and it's called heat blasting. So it blasts the flowers off, which in turn you can't produce any seeds. Uh, to the left, that's an insect. An insect pierces the pod, which, which then kills that area of the pod and the seed. And to the right, we have a disease that affects the root of the canola plant. So these are just one of many. There's a lot of insects. There's a lot of diseases. But of course, we're not going to go through all of them. <laughs> so we get to harvest. And it's crazy because I've been uh, in agriculture now for about 10 years. And I don't have any other <laughs> harvest of uh, canola harvest photos. But there are, are two ways you can harvest canola. So in here, um, if you guys are familiar with the stripes in the field, these are called swaths. And so farmers can either go in at a particular maturity time and either cut it down and let it mature in these swaths and harvest it once it gets to maturity, or they can let it stand in the field and they can go in at a later date and just straight cut it down. And what happens is the combine takes the crop in, it thrashes the seed out, and then it expels the residue behind it or majority of it. And so farmers don't sell everything right off the combine. They have to store it uh, depending on when they can sell it. So they have to have a lot of bins. And bins can be of any size. You can even have bags to store it. So there's a lot of different options and it's really whatever works for the farmer. But constant monitoring has to go into uh, these bins to make sure that your seed doesn't spoil. And so I'm not sure who's all seen canola seed. But this is a bin that was being cleared out. So there's a lot of residue in it, but canola seed are black uh, balls, really small black balls. And so they, you have quite a few um, in a pod and these are what's pressed to get the oil from them. And they contain about 45% of oil. And so, yeah, the residue, there's a lot of residue. It does eventually get cleaned out. Um, but yeah, because it's light, it floats to the top when you're emptying a bin. I think that that's also a very common misunderstanding that like where the oil comes from, right? Like it's inside the seed. That's where it comes from. You, you see the beautiful yellow flowers in the summer. And I think it's very cool to make that connection. Yeah. And, and the black seed uh, is what's mainly grown. It's Argentine variety. Um, and so it's going to be black. But if we get into other varieties like Polish, it could be a lighter brown. But mainly it's the black seeds. Um, that we're looking at here in Canada. Cool. So when we get to my research uh, and why I'm researching what I what I am, um, I wanted to first talk about the you know the importance of canola to Canada, and it creates around 250 thousand jobs and contributes 11.2 billion dollars in wages. So it's really important to the economy of Canada, but also to our health. It is not only one of the most healthy edible oils, uh, it's also very affordable. So, um, you know, it suits all households in that manner, which is, <laughs> I really appreciate. So we have to continue to be able to grow canola and uh, there are pests that threaten its, the yield and the production of canola. So I'm studying clever disease. So typically canola has a really big taproot, um, but as you can see in the photo, there's those big gulls 
uh, they're not very, they look like big warts almost. You could, you could make the connection there. Um, so this disease affects vegetables. Uh, so they're on the Brassicaceae family and that's just a, a family of plants. And so that contains your favorite vegetables, really, just kidding. Uh, your broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. So it has been around actually since the Roman times. This is not a new disease. It's in the 20th century, so between 1900 and 2000. It was found in vegetables uh, in BC, Ontario, Quebec, and Maritime. So it's, like I said, it's not new by any means, but it was only found in Alberta on canola in 2003. And what this does is it creates the swelling of the host or like the canola or whatever plant it's attacking, it causes its roots to swell and it cuts off all the water and nutrients being able to move through that plant. So, and, and as those galls, those like wart-like figures, uh, as they decompose or decay, they release more spores into the soil. And so when you get that, you know, that spore level up really high, um, you can actually not be able to grow canola if it gets so bad. So, you know, I don't want to be too specific about my research, but I'm not reinventing the wheel. Um, I'm just looking at the spore level. So right at the soil, uh, really, you know, I need a microscope to see, see these spores. I'm looking at that level to see how all these different management strategies that have been proven in research to help manage club root. Um, you know, what do they do, you know, on their own, but then also in a big group uh, when you put them all together and their effects. And hopefully I can help farmers determine which ones are the best to use. Um, so with that, that's kind of all I want to talk about for my research. And I would like to end on, you know, especially in the age of COVID right now, we're all quite familiar with the PCR test, right? We, we get a PCR test to see if we have we test positive for COVID-19 or not. So right now what I'm doing in the lab is I'm looking at my soil samples to see if they're positive or negative, if they detect the club root DNA or not. Um, and so what I wanted to show you guys was kind of a time lapse of myself in the lab. As you can see there in the middle, I'm working on these dilutions that I've extracted the DNA from my soil um, because it contains DNA and I make these dilutions and I put them into these really tiny tubes and they go into this PCR machine on your right hand side. And what PCR stands for is the polymerase chain reaction. And so what happens in the machine is it goes through a bunch of different cycles of different temperatures and it helps amplify and replicate the DNA um, in my sample. And as you can see on the left hand side, like there's just a little molecule minuscule, I should say, uh, amount in that little tiny tube. It calls little tiny calluses on your fingers. Um, but then once once they're done in the PCR machine, you have to then visualize what's going on in those um, in those tubes. And so not necessarily this is the way that they do it for COVID-19, but this is what I do in the lab to see if I have club root or not in my soil samples. So this is a gel. I'm making a gel, pulling these molds out, and then I'm taking those PCR samples, I'm adding a dye so it's easier to see, and I'm injecting them into these little holes here. And then I basically electrify this gel. I push electricity through it, and it pulls DNA fragments through the gel, and I then have this as a result. So that doesn't really show you anything, but I put it into this box, and with different lights, it comes up with this image. And so basically what I'm learning from this, which I think is really cool, uh, <laughs> probably a little nerdy, um, <laughs> these are my controls. So these are my positives. So this has the DNA that I'm looking for and this doesn't. And so then I compare that against all of my samples. And this is showing that I have positive, that everything tests positive for club root. So it's showing that in every one of my samples, I have the pathogen that I'm looking for, which is pretty interesting. Anyways, so yeah, I just wanted to touch on that. I think it was pretty, you know, we can relate to it right now with everything that we're going through. I'm sure everyone's had a test at least once up the nose or in the mouth. But um, yeah, with that, thank you guys. I know we went from something very broad to something very specific in the canola industry, but I also attached my Twitter handle and my school email if you guys have any larger questions that you wanna ask outside of the chat box.
Perfect. Thanks so much, Brittany. And I was doing some thinking during your presentation, and I actually think that we'd be able to share that Kahoot with the teachers who registered. So if they are wanting to go through those questions with their students um, and kind of re either refresh their memory of what they learned during this tour, I think that that's definitely something we can do as well. Um, I know we had some technical difficulties, and I guess, like Madeline said, that's just kind of the world we're living in, and uh, whether it's rural internet or stable internet, but, you know, different screen sharing and all that fun stuff. So thanks to everyone for kind of sticking with us throughout that process. Yeah, I have a, I think, a, a pretty important question for, for you, Brittany. I think at the be very beginning of your presentation, you mentioned the word agronomist. Um, and not everybody knows that that's near and dear to my heart, but not everybody really knows what that is. And um, I think one of the other themes we've carried through the other tours is what important roles support farmers. So what um, roles out there support canola farmers to allow them to do what they do and, and keep doing it? OK, so as an agronomist, um, oh. So specifically, I, I had a few roles. So one was to support um, products that I was selling. And I had to then convey to the farmer, you know, how does it benefit them um, at, in the field level? And so maybe we're looking at like a seed treatment and how does that, what does that do to the plants and what are the benefits of it? I've worked at a fertilizer dealership. So I talked about what fertilizer requirements you should be, you know, I do a soil sample and I say, these are the nutrients that you're missing um, or that you need to supplement with. Uh, you can go and look in a field and, and look at all these weeds and you then have to choose a chemical that targets those weeds. So it can get pretty complex because there can be a lot of products, uh, but you're looking, you're just trying to help that farmer through, you know, not only the growing season, but through the winter time to make sure that they're getting the appropriate products to um, be not only economical, but efficient and, and being smart of the environment. Awesome. Awesome. And I so, know that a really great um, way for young people who are looking to get in, learn more about plants and maybe a little bit more about agriculture is maybe working as a crop scout for a summer. I'm not sure if you ever did that, but I'm sure you worked with a lot of crop scouts. Can you tell us a little bit about that kind of summer job? Yeah, so that was my first uh, job in the agriculture industry. And holy smokes, that was, I learned so much. And actually, I worked at the retail that you used to work at uh, with Emil. So he taught me everything. Why volunteer canola in the next year is not, it's not good. It's considered a weed, even though you grew the crop beforehand. Uh, you just learn a ton. You walk a lot of fields, you see a lot of crops, you see a lot of diseases, insects, weeds, and it's not just canola. You get to see different rotations. So you can see um, faba beans, peas. What are some other ones? There's a little bit of flax grown, a little bit of chickpeas. We have wheat and barley, of course. So there's just, there's a ton of crops. And, and like the further south you go, you have beets, sugar beets, you have sunflowers. So yeah, it was a real eye opener for this urban individual. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely saw a lot of value out of that um, myself. And I could definitely echo that you see a lot of really cool things in the field. And, and even crop scouts get to use a lot of technology. I know I was recording everything I was seeing like on an iPad. Um, maybe you could comment a little bit of, uh, more about the different types of like technology and devices that canola farmers might use. Maybe I think you've talked a little bit about precision agriculture, but maybe you could talk a little bit about um, like precision uh, fertilizer mapping or, or talk about some of the other technologies that farmers are using now, especially in Western Canada. Mm -hmm. So a really cool one, I think, which I, I do not understand because there's, there's a lot to it. Um, but we like zone out fields to understand the different pH. We can understand their organic matter, the nutrients, the type of soil that there is. So then we can, um, you know, if, a, if an area of land was say at the bottom of a slough, we'd map it. Well, we wouldn't put any fertilizer in there. So it would show areas of where uh, places in the field that need more fertilizer and places in the field that don't need any more fertilizer. Uh, so then not only are, again, farmers saving money, but we're not putting products where we don't need it. Uh, we have to be really cognizant that we're being stewards of the land and we're not contributing to, you know, the environmental going backwards 
or sorry, environmental, the environment or the climate going backwards. Um, we, we need to be very cautious about what we do to the land. So that's one technology I think is really cool. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of tools online to help farmers specifically with canola, like how to set your equipment so that you're seeding the proper rate to then get a proper number of plant stands, because that has been researched quite a bit to make sure that you want to put down even the right amount of seeds to get a certain percentage of uh, plant sprouting. Um, so, you know, you can get some pretty basic technology that's really useful, but also some really advanced technology that is just as useful. Yeah. And I think, um, Brittany, too, I know we are running out of time, but I did want to uh, ask one question um, just from your perspective on the safety of GMO canola. Like, how can you speak to that in over your 10 years in the industry of how safe that that science is? Yeah. So GMOs are one of the most studied crops because it is under the most scrutiny. And ultimately, there has been no evidence to show that they're not healthy for you. They're actually just as healthy as organics or conventionally produced um, crops. So unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation and people are very scared of it because it can be very complex. There are a ton of breeding methods um, and complexity is easy to misunderstand things. Mm -hmm. um, but GMOs, yeah, I mean, farmers choose to grow them. They see the benefits not for and it's and it's not like a money thing. It's literally they they do better in the field. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we get like I said, we get to use less chemicals. We get to treat our soil better. And then those farmers feed their food to their kids. Oh, oh, oh no! <laughs> okay, where All did right. she go? Okay, well, it's a day of technology, that's for sure. Um, so I think we had to wrap up anyways. I do see Brittany popping back in here. Um, are you back with us, Brittany? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was just saying that the farmers feed the food to their their families as well. So we can have a lot of confidence in our in our food system here in Canada. Perfect. Well, I really want to thank you, Brittany, for your time today. And I just really appreciate your perspective and also your experience in working in this industry. Um, I do want to flip back that you do you did put your Twitter handle there. So if people do have questions that they have for you that we weren't able to answer, I would really encourage people to seek out some research and some and some some learning that they can do. And then if they have any further questions, then we can definitely approach those as well. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry about all the technical glitches. No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. Thank you. All okay. right. That was awesome. And I know, yeah, we can never really expect technology to uh, cooperate all the time. But um, we do have to head out because we've got our next tour starting in 15 minutes. Um, and so I just had a few things to flag. Um, we'll be back with our beef rancher at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern. And if you want a copy of The Real Dirt on Farming, um, it's available in English and French at the website, realdirtonfarming.ca. And for print copies of the magazine, you can get in touch with your um, provincial member organization through Agriculture in the Classroom Canada. All right, so we will see you back here at 4 o'clock. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.